Hello and welcome everyone to Oceanside Libraries program. This program is uh, sponsored to us by New York State Assemblywoman Missy Miller. Thank you so much for bringing us this program and Northwell Health. Uh, and without further ado, I'd love to introduce our presenter for this evening, Dr. Penny Stern. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. And can you still see the screen? Yes. Great. So uh, hello everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Um, this evening, I'm going to be speaking about acupuncture, and most of you have probably heard something about acupuncture, but have any of you actually tried it? If you have, you can write into the chat box and say whether or not you've ever had an acupuncture experience. I'd be curious to know. Um, so if I leave anything out, those of you who are familiar with acupuncture, please feel free to chime in with your experiences. I'm trained as a medical acupuncturist. That means I am not a practitioner of traditional Chinese medicine, but am rather an allopathically trained MD who studied acupuncture, learning from physicians and acupuncturists how to best utilize this technique in the practice of conventional medicine. In New York State, hundreds of hours are required to become licensed in acupuncture so you can be sure that if you seek out somebody who's licensed, you will be in very good hands. Acupuncture is no more experimental as a mode of treatment than is the Chinese language as a mode of communication. What is experimental is not acupuncture, but Westerners understanding of it and their ability to use it properly. I always like to start with this quote because it comes from way back in 1980, Yes, exactly 40 years ago, when a court case was brought to determine whether acupuncture was a legitimate treatment modality. And the final decision included this line, which I think sums up very well how I and others feel about acupuncture. In this case, it was the US District Court of Southern Texas that was ruling in Andrews versus Ballard. Um, those who do not believe in acupuncture or who don't actually understand it are really potentially missing out on a very helpful treatment modality. So what is acupuncture? It's actually believed that acupuncture in some form has been practiced in China for over 2,500 years. They found what they think are primitive acupuncture needles in ancient Chinese tombs, believe it or not. So acupuncture gradually extended throughout Asia from China and is now all over the world. There are some variations in Asia, but the basic principles remain the same. What acupuncture involves is the insertion of very fine needles into specific points on the surface of the, of the body. Uh, these very thin metal needles are manipulated manually, or the needle may be stimulated with electrical stimulation, which is called electroacupuncture. Acupuncture needles are very flexible and they're actually made of stainless steel, which prevents two things. First, not to rust. And the second, of course, not to break. Um, these needles are only one use, meaning you can't reuse them, which avoids any possibility of contamination. And the length of these needles varies between 13 to 130 millimeters, which is about point 5.1 to 5.12 inches with shorter needles. Um, usually the shorter needles are used near uh, more sensitive areas on, on the face. Um, longer needles are areas with thicker tissues and the diameters also vary. The thinnest needles may be so flexible that you need these small tubes to guide the needles for insertion, otherwise they would bend and these plastic tubes then come off once the needles are in place. Um, acupuncture is a, is a key component of traditional Chinese medicine, and it's based on a philosophy that describes the universe and the human body in terms of two opposing forces, yin and yang. When these forces are in balance, the body is healthy, and energy, called qi, flows along specific pathways throughout the body, and the energy flow keeps the yin and yang forces balanced. But if the flow of energy gets blocked, like water getting stuck behind a dam, the disruption can lead to pain, lack of function, illness, 
And acupuncture is believed to release block chi in the body and stimulate proper functioning. And this is according to traditional Chinese medicine. It's somewhat different when we talk about the way we use it in allopathic and osteopathic medicine, and I'll get to that in a minute. The insertion points, the points where the needles are actually placed, correspond with pathways within the body called meridians. And I'll have more to say about this in a minute. Qi, and that's the, uh, the Chinese symbol for qi, um, must be able to flow freely through the body. Qi permeates all things. And in order to maintain health, it flows through these meridians. Meridians are a series of channels through which qi flows. A meridian is called Jing Lao in Chinese. Um, the meridians are known by many different names, such as acu, acupuncture meridians, energy vessels, all kinds of names. And think of it as like a highway system, like a network that can be mapped out throughout the body. Um, this is similar if you think about the circulatory system in, in, in our medicine, in Western medicine. But I have to emphasize that meridians are not physical. There's not meridian channels in the conventional sense all over the body. There are 12 major or primary meridians, and these are the most important meridians of the body. Uh, they connect to what are called the Zhang Fu organs and are the main pathways that transport qi and blood throughout the body. The Zhang Fu organ theory covers all organs in the human body. There are five Zhang organs and six Fu organs. The Zhang organs include the heart, the lungs, the kidney, the liver, the spleen, and the Fu organs include the gallbladder, the large intestine, the small intestine, the urinary bladder, and the San Jiao, which is otherwise known as the triple system. Uh, there's no equivalent in Western medicine for the San Jiao, but the best way to explain the concept is that this has the ability to influence the other organs and overall health, mainly through the movement of qi. Um, it's believed that the uh, San Jiao is essential to transport fluids through the body, treating swellings and overcoming problems with various organs. And then there is something called extraordinary vessels whose primary function is to connect the 12 primary meridians. And then there are more meridians that are responsible for connecting the two types of qi. And at the end of it all, there's more than 2,000 possible acupuncture points themselves. So it takes some time to become fully acquainted with all the points that are available to the acupuncturist. And generally, the points are used in combination, but occasionally they're used one at a time. There is one famous acupuncturist that I learned about when I was training more than a decade ago who basically uses only one or two points from all the thousands that are out there. He just uses one or two, and it sounded very strange to me, but apparently he's had some remarkable successes. But for most of us, there are many points to choose from, and, and we do. So this is a, a partial map of the meridians and the points. And as you can see, it's complicated. If you're in the hands of a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner, Acupuncture is used to treat a wide range of ailments. Traditional Chinese medicine will use it for depression, kidney problems, flu, fatigue, um, paralysis, high blood pressure, tendinitis, vision problems, and on and on and on and on. Because traditional Chinese medicine, uh, which we're not gonna be really talking about in this talk in detail, is very different than Western allopathic or osteopathic medicine. But some of the same markers of health and illness that they use are also used in the West. And the goal of traditional Chinese medicine, like the goal of Western medicine, is to heal the patient. The difference is, is that TCM is based on the cardinal principle of qi, something which is not really recognized in conventional Western medicine. But medical acupuncture um, is the term used to acupuncture practiced by people like me who are trained in Western medicine. We are physicians and nurses and other types of clinicians who have taken courses in acupuncture, you know, with an eye towards applying this to the treatment of specific conditions. And medical acupuncture is recognized by the World Health Organization for the management of, of certain things um, like neurological and muscular disorders, tension, stress, and particularly for pain and for smoking cessation. And research has demonstrated that acupuncture has effects on the nervous system 
has effects on the endocrine and the immune system, the cardiovascular system, the digestive system. So by, by stimulating various systems in the body, acupuncture can help resolve pain, can help improve sleep, and it really enhances a general sense of, of well-being. So what's in a name? If you look at an atlas of acupuncture points, and they're big, big, fat books, you would see that each point has a name and a numbered kind of acronym. For example, GV20 is governing vessel 20, and LI4 is liver 4. Um, but many Westerners may not be familiar with the Chinese language, and it's common to use the pinyin system of transliteration when referring to Chinese names of points. Uh, I don't speak Chinese beyond being able to imitate some of the names of points, but you try using this system to give people a sense of what it sounds like. And conveniently, we also have English translations of, of various points. So I'm going to talk about a couple of popular points, at least I think they're popular and I, and I like them. Um, Hegu, or Joining Valley, is a very useful point. It's also called capital L, capital I, four. And you can even use it yourselves as an acupressure point. In fact, most acupuncture points also function well as acupressure points. Um, you can see from the picture where this point is located. It's between the base of your thumb and your index finger. And using this point can help relieve pain and headaches, toothaches, some people find it helpful for sore throats, even for a sore backache, um, and some people for high blood pressure. Um, many people find acupressure at this point to be as effective as acupuncture. So if you try right now to find the space on your left hand between the base of your left thumb and your index finger, you can actually find Hegu or joining valley. Niguan or inner pass. And some of you may actually be familiar with this point because inner pass on the, it, on the inner wrist is known for being particularly helpful to control motion sickness as well as any kind of condition that's associated with nausea like morning sickness or seasickness. Um, you probably have seen bands for sale which are supposed to help with motion sickness. They're using the same acupuncture, acupressure point um, and it's, it's helpful for its calming effect. And it also works for insomnia, for people who have chronic sleep issues. So if you look at this picture here, you see the three fingers are being used to measure the distance from the hand and between the tendons. And that's how you know where this point is. It's also known, by the way, as pericardium six. Luogen or fell off the pillow is a point often used both with acupressure and with acupuncture to relieve neck pain. Luogen means fell off the pillow in Chinese. It's an acupuncture, acupressure point, and it's found at the back of the hand in between the two bones in the depression just past the knuckles of the index and middle fingers. And it's used to treat neck pain. Uh, for example, if you had a bad head posture while you were sleeping, and for many people, it, it brings significant relief. So if you have bad posture or you're spending too much time in front of a laptop or you just slept bad um, and your neck just won't move in the right way, you may want to try this as acupressure, if not acupuncture. You press firmly with the tip of a finger into the depression of the point so that you feel a tender sensation. I find I get the best pressure by using the tip of my thumb. And you maintain this pressure while rubbing in small circles on the point. That's obvious you're doing it as an acupressure and not acupuncture, which would just be the insertion of a needle. This is my favorite point. It's governing vessel 20 or Bai Hui in Chinese. It makes you feel extraordinarily calm. It also helps with dizziness. It can help with headache and eye pain. Um, this particular point works very well when it's needled as opposed to acupressure. It's also known as one of the longevity points um, and it's, it's good for stress reduction as a result. When I was learning acupuncture, my classmates thought it was hilarious that I loved walking around with the needle in my head 
right at this point, which I did pretty regularly, they started calling it Penny's Point. And it doesn't hurt, but I can definitely attest to the fact that it does make you feel wonderfully calm, which is why it's so useful for anyone who's feeling irritable. It's also good for, for, uh, for kind of painful things like, like headache. Um, TCM, you know, traditional Chinese medicine practitioners will also use governing vessel 20 for red eyes. Um, not sure how well that works in, in my neck of the woods, but they will use it for that. Uh, the translation of Bai Wei is 100 meetings, and in traditional Chinese medicine, this point is said to treat 100 diseases. They're kind of very romantic connection. Um, it is the uppermost point on the entire body. It's located on the crown of the head, on the scalp, and according to Chinese medical theory, this point also benefits the brain and calms the spirit. So governing vessel 20 is definitely my favorite point. So of course, in, in my world of allopathic medicine, we try to make decisions based on evidence, the evidence-based approach. And we take the same approach to acupuncture. So we ask the questions, does it work? And if so, what is the efficacy? What is the effectiveness of the technique? Does it have a biologically plausible mechanism? What about the placebo effect? And of course, what's the safety profile? Is there any toxicity associated with it? This is what we apply to everything, but we also apply it to acupuncture when we study it. But what does the evidence show? Well, based on the research, the evidence has shown that acupuncture works well to control nausea, vomiting, as well as pain especially pain from dental procedures, low back pain. It has some good effects supplementing other modalities for pain, pain in the neck, osteoarthritis, headache, migraine, carpal tunnel syndrome, tennis elbow, cramps, uh, some allergic and asthmatic symptoms, although these are less clear. But you can see a common denominator most of the time, and acupuncture works especially well and consistently for pain-based problems. And other studies have looked at acupuncture as a treatment for high blood pressure, chest pain, and the ringing in the ears known as tinnitus. With these conditions, the efficacy of acupuncture is much less clear. But many people stand by the technique as helpful. And I say, if it works, that's great. Um, my view is that acupuncture may be a useful adjunct to some conventional strategies but especially with things like high blood pressure, if you've been prescribed medication, that's your first line of defense. Never stop taking a medication without first discussing with your prescriber. And of course, don't self-prescribe either. And don't replace medication with any modality, not even acupuncture, unless it's been discussed thoroughly with your prescriber. I want to talk a little bit about how pain is transmitted, which may give you an idea of why we believe acupuncture works so well for pain. Um, there are specific pain receptors. These are nerve endings, and they're present in most body tissues, and they only respond to damaging or potentially damaging stimuli. And second, the messages that are initiated by these stimuli are transmitted by specific identified nerves to the spinal cord. And the sensitive nerve endings in the tissue and the nerve attached to it together form a unit called a primary afferent nociceptor. And the primary afferent nociceptor contacts neurons in the spinal cord. Those are nerve cells. And these cells relay the messages through pathways to higher brain centers, including the brain stem, the thalamus, the somatosensory cortex, the limbic system. It's thought that the processes that underlie pain perception involve primarily the thalamus and the cortex. That's what studies seem to have shown us. Now, C fibers are one type of fiber that transmits signals to the spinal cord. And these fibers carry signals for pain that is diffuse or dull or burning or aching. Sometimes we refer to it as second or slow, slow pain. Alpha delta fibers are another type of fiber. This kind of pain is associated with sharp, stinging, pricking kind of pain. It's fast pain or first pain. 
So what does acupuncture do, we believe? If you think about these pain pathways as a kind of highway, putting an acupuncture needle, that is a physical obstacle, in the middle of that highway serves to interrupt the pain pathway, which is why we believe that acupuncture works so well for pain. You're actually putting a physical block in the pathway of pain. Therefore, it can't be properly transmitted if it's being blocked. And studies have also shown that pressure and heat and electrical stimulation enhance the effect of acupuncture. So many people use these additional techniques, uh, particularly in traditional Chinese medicine, and not so much in, uh, in the allopathic or osteopathic use of medical acupuncture, although many people do use the electrical stimulation, which I'll get to more in a minute later. So the responses to acupuncture can occur locally, that is at a site close to the site where you put the needles or at a distance. And um, we think that nerve cells that are called sensory neurons, they mediate the effect within the central nervous system, which then activates pathways in the brain and also in the peripheral nervous system. There's been a lot of attention focused on how acupuncture achieves this pain relieving effect. And it's believed that opioid like substances are released during acupuncture. So imagine that getting the effect of pain relief usually seen with opioid narcotics without any medication or illicit substances at all. Well, what about the placebo effect? Well, there have always been questions among researchers about whether acupuncture just produces a placebo effect. Um, many studies have looked at this and found that while sham acupuncture, that means using points unsystematically and not following the traditional location of active points, so sham acupuncture does sometimes produce improvement in patients. But there are differences actually in the physiologic responses that could be measured. So real acupuncture leads to measurable improvements in outcomes. And there was one particular study that I always like to cite that real acupuncture as opposed to sham points was linked to long-term improvement for certain symptoms. And that's really what you're aiming for is long-term improvement. No physiologic improvements resulted from the sham acupuncture. So that was key. And real acupuncture, it's possible that it improves symptoms by actually helping to rewire the sensory areas of the brain uh, in addition to the fact that the needles may be modifying local blood flow to the peripheral nerves, it's, it's very intriguing for scientists to see that acupuncture may actually impact both peripheral and central neurophysiology, because it's, it's hard to actually do that in any other way. With sham point studies, there is less effect or shorter effects and definitely less cumulative effect, which is what you really want. So anybody who's had acupuncture knows that at the beginning, more sessions are scheduled. And then as the results take effect, fewer sessions are, are generally required. That's the cumulative effect that we look for. Another interesting thing, which I like to mention, is that acupuncture has been found to be effective in children and animals, both of whom are unlikely to be swayed by any expectations or knowing about placebo effects or anything. Um, and there are plenty of people who've taken their pets for acupuncture with very good results. Naturally, there are side effects. Um, if they occur, they're generally mild. I'm not sure how many people would object to feelings of euphoria, but these may occur. Since acupuncture is often provided with a person laying down, if you get up too quickly, you may be lightheaded. So there may be some transient lightheadedness. And while acupuncture is essentially painless, there are some points, particularly some of them used by traditional Chinese medicine practitioners, that may be relatively painful. I say relatively because compared to normal acupuncture that really doesn't hurt at all, these could, could sting. I personally do not use those points. For example, some of these are located around the fingernails. When, when we were learning and practicing on ourselves, believe me, this was not enjoyable. So even if a TCM practitioner might use them, I do not. Um, Di Qi refers to the excitation of Qi inside the meridians by acupuncture needles. And what patients experience is 
kind of an intense sensation such as numbness, soreness, or, or distension, this is actually something that you want to achieve. If, if a, a traditional Chinese medicine um, practitioner does not observe this, they believe that they've used the wrong point. So the acupressure point, the acupuncture point is inaccurate, or the depth of the needle was wrong, or they didn't manually manipulate it properly. Lots of, lots of things are blamed. So um, if the DQ is not observed, manual manipulation techniques are often applied to promote it. So this is something that you do want to see, especially in traditional Chinese medicine, um, but it is referred to as a side effect. Other complications are much more unlikely. I have never seen a lock needle, but that refers to a muscular spasm that would make it difficult to withdraw a needle. I have personally never seen that, but I'm, I'm sure it exists or else they wouldn't um, teach it. Um, once upon a time, there used to be allergic reactions to the metal of the needles, but since, as I said before, needles are now stainless steel, we don't see allergic reactions. They're basically unknown, so that's kind of a historical oddity. Forgotten needle is also unlikely because practitioners always count their needles when concluding um, a session, but I suppose that if many sites are needles simultaneously, it's possible to forget one since the needles are so fine and maybe a little difficult to see. But since the needles often have plastic heads of different colors, that the, the colors actually denote different sizes and types of needles, but it makes it very easy to see. So it's unlikely to have a forgotten needle. There are some contraindications, however, for acupuncture. For people with pacemakers, electrical acupuncture, which is acupuncture enhanced by the use of a TENS-like device, TENS refers to transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, which is, some of you may have experienced it with physical therapy, it's the use of electric current produced to stimulate nerves for various therapeutic purposes. So it's not a good idea for people with pacemakers to get electrical acupuncture. It also has to be done carefully with pregnant patients because you wouldn't want to stimulate labor and traditional Chinese medicine uh, practitioners will tell you that you can stimulate labor if you needle people who are pregnant, heavily pregnant in, in the incorrect way. But most practitioners will say that when you know your points, initiating labor is very unlikely. For people who have metal implants, of any kind. Again, no electrical acupuncture. It may feel very uncomfortable. And I think it's pretty obvious that acupuncture is not indicated for people who are either emotionally agitated or have been using drugs or alcohol and are not in full um, command of their judgment and their reasoning. Acupuncture is not advised in patients who are either post-stroke or have had transient ischemic attack within the first week or two after the event because they're usually hemodynamically unstable at that time, so you don't want to take any chances with that. I'd like to just mention some of the techniques that are either used in integrative medicine or partner with integrative medicine. You're probably familiar with many of these. They include deep breathing exercises, Reiki, guided imagery, reflexology, among many others. We have a center for wellness and integrative medicine at Northwell, and there we offer acupuncture services, but also energy healing, Reiki, meditation, Pilates, aromatherapy, Tai Chi, and, and much, much more. Um, what separates integrative medicine from conventional medical practice is that integrative medicine treats the whole person and not just the disease. So many of these techniques are deployed to manage the same condition in addition to conventional medications and treatment. So it really is a partnering and not an of instead of. Just want to mention who's who at the Center for Wellness and Integrative Medicine. We have uh, Deb McElligot, who's a DNP, that's a doctor of nursing practice and a master coach and instructor. We have Lisa Bondi, who directs yoga, Tina Conroy, who directs energy healing and is a Reiki master. Lisa Langer, Dr. Langer is the director of mindfulness-based stress reduction training. Uh, Jennifer Caliendo is the operations director and Deb Demisa is the project manager and I'm the director of preventive medicine. 
uh, the Center for Wellness and Integrative Medicine is located in, in Roslyn. Um, in the next few months, I'm going to be starting a lifestyle medicine practice at the center. Lifestyle medicine is the subset of preventive medicine dedicated to helping people with exercise, nutrition, sleep, substance use, stress reduction. Um, since something like 70 plus percent of chronic disease is believed to be preventable, lifestyle medicine aims to help people implement the lifestyle changes that can either delay or prevent entirely the onset of chronic disease. So we're very, we're very proud of this center. So that's basically it. Does anybody have any questions? If you do, I'm happy to answer them now. No questions? Well, thank you so much for listening. I wish you a good evening. Take care and be well. Dr. Stern, I had